Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And today's video, well, it's a little special because it follows uh, the live stream that I did today with the XRP Zoo. That is really fun. So if you haven't caught one of their live streams, check it out. It is just full of laughs. And so um, after I got done, I thought, well, I really wanted to talk about the bullish statements that were made by Mr. Kitao of SBI Holdings because uh, in light of the current news that we heard with R3 and SWIFT uh, doing the proof of concept trial, uh, I think that the statements that were made from Mr. Kitao in the end of the quarter three results were just fabulous and I really wanted to touch on that because he is so clearly committed to pushing the XRP uh, digital asset in combination with R3's Corda Settler and also continuing to push the Ripple technology through MoneyTap uh, bringing in XRP with that application and expanding it out to all the partners that he has access to. So I just really wanted to do that. However, there is this Trolley's McTroll Faces blog that put out something in the last, um, well, I guess it's been in the last 24 hours. And the title of his blog is called Ripple's 200 plus institutional clients claim is a scam. And I just thought to myself, well, if I don't do this, who's going to do it? And we need to just show this world that the guy who put together this blog is just so way off in so many ways. And so I want to take it item by item. Uh, if you can hang in there with me, we will just pull this thing apart because it's just unbelievably poorly done. So the first thing he talks about in terms of being a scam is SendFriend. And he says that their website is just one landing page without any links. And there uh, is a place that allows you to set up an account. So he did. Now, if he had been paying attention, he would have known that this particular site is um, as a result of the MIT Media Lab Innovation Alliance Award. It is going to launch in quarter one, 2019. So it has not launched. And if he was paying attention, he would have known that. The backers behind SendFriend are very prestigious financial companies like Barclays Bank and MasterCard. So I'm sorry, but your uh, lack of knowledge in not knowing that they haven't even launched yet is just laughable that would, you would use this as your first proof that the partners that Ripple is claiming to have are scams. So you clicked on submit and you were re-rejected to a second page and the last page of the burgeoning financial institution, which looks like this. Great, you're on a wait list. Well, yeah, you're on a wait list because it has not launched yet. So you are in the queue and you are number 100 uh, or 1,336. So damn you, right? Apparently SendFriend is nothing but a couple of web pages of a 10-year-old that is uh, could have been pieced together over a day or two. Well, it's not live yet. Okay, so um, why don't you go ahead and tell me again that MIT Media Labs, Barclays, and MasterCard are also a scam. And then you, the, the next company you cite is JNFX, and they are founded as is claimed on the website and confirmed by the UK company listings back to 2007 in the heart of the city. And this appears to be their main selling point as the reference to the geographical location comes up everywhere on the website so much that I had to check for myself. And you found their postal address at 68 Lombard Street in London. And yes, this is definitely their postal address. As a matter of fact, 
When we go to the UK government site, we can see that they have a registered office on the third floor of 118 Cromwell Road in London. SW7, by the way, if you would have ever lived in London like I have, you'll know that this is the Kensington neighborhood. The Kensington neighborhood is where Kensington Palace is. It is also Princess Diana's old neighborhood. It is one of the most up scale neighborhoods in all of London. And then you can see they have a business address, which is 68 Lombard Street, London, and then the following uh, zip code. So here I want to take a look at the address building. We are looking at Google Map and you can see here, this is an aerial shot. There are a lot of very prestigious companies in here. And when we actually go to the website that talks about how expensive the square footage is, you can see that it ranges from 47 uh, uh, pounds per square foot up to 75 pounds. This is a very, very expensive uh, office space in London and South Kensington at that. I want to just, you know, I don't, I don't think you've ever I don't think you've actually ever run a business because these particular shared spaces are the trend right now. As a matter of fact, there's a company called WeWork. It's an American company that started in 2010. They're out of New York City. They are valued at $47 billion and they manage more than 10 million square feet. They have 100,000 members that use their shared office space. They are in 77 cities, 23 countries, and these countries are not rinky-dink countries. This is uh, China, Japan, Hong Kong, Germany, India, Brazil, just to name a few. As a matter of fact, in January of this year, Mr. Son, who is the CEO of SoftBank, which uh, he is the richest man in Japan, his company is the 39th largest in the world, fourth in Japan, just behind Toyota MUFG, which by the way, remember that bank's name because we're gonna talk about that later, and NTT Data. He just gave them second round of funding for uh, the tune of $2 billion. So it, you, I think you're totally not understanding that shared office space in the world is the way it's going, and this is where the growth in this particular uh, vertical space is happening. And it's not an address that you would be embarrassed about. You should see the locations in Tokyo, how cool they are and how expensive they are. So the fact that they are in a shared space if they want to meet a client, which in their business they probably don't need to do very often, I am not thinking poorly of that at all. I think you are just not keeping up with the times. In addition to that, I can find the actual financials for them back from 2015. Here we go. Back now to 2016. Wow, nice jump, nice direction. And here is where we left off at 105 for 2016. And the total equity is jumped for 2017, which is the last year reported that I can find on a government site. Holy cow, did they increase their sales. Now going back to the JNF X, let's see, you also, okay, so you also say that, um, digging a little deeper, that Mr. Nathan Samuel Essenberg is the director and the secretary. Well, again, have you ever started your own company? I mean, hello, sometimes you wear more than one hat. I, I just don't think you're, um, it, it just looks ridiculous. Of course, people in small companies wear more than one hat. So it's just crazy. Okay, the next company you cite is Financial Transaction Control Systems. And this is a Swedish FinTech startup. Yes, it is. And it was developed, uh, or it had developed an e-wallet. 
Yes, it did. Now, if you really researched, if you really had taken the time to see, this is a project that is from the past, all right? It is not from uh, what is currently being um, promoted or supported today. <clears throat> Here is the FTCS website, and you can see that the core banking is the center of their core, the hub, if you will. And then we have the spokes, which are vouchers, cards, blockchain, and currencies. You don't see a wallet, do you? No, because in small companies, which have a lot of different spokes, if you will, to get their businesses off the ground, people have visions, and they have uh uh, projects. Some are successful, some are not. If you had 10 different projects as a small company, I can guarantee you that probably 50% of them will not pan out. And you usually cut your losses and you uh, stop pouring money into projects that don't have a return. And I am guessing that the wallet was just one of those such projects and they just decided to not continue that part of their business. It is totally understandable to stick with the profitable channels that are giving the small company back a return. Now, if you had, again, really researched this, you would have found that FTCS, as you see here, is actually in a portfolio of companies owned by Front Office. Front Office was formed in 2013 in Stockholm. In 2016, they become, became a public company. They actually are audited by Ernst & Young, so I believe their numbers, and they are an investment company that specializes in taking uh, young startups and turning them around and launching them big time. So you can see here in the next page I'm going to show you, this is the team. Very seasoned, very respectful. I'm not going to spend too much time going over each bio just because I want to cover everything that you claim is a scam in your blog. And so I uh, can tell you that should you want to look at who is actually behind the company front office. It's very impressive. And they decided back in August of 2018 to give this particular company 20 million Swedish kroner as an investment. And it is to get them to a position financially where they are really, really moving in the right direction. As a matter of fact, I can see the front office financial report for uh, June. This is quarter two. Uh, this is up till June of 2018. And this word here, or these two words together, uh, which is summa till gangar, that means it's not too difficult for, for me it, in Swedish because I speak a little Norwegian, uh, means total assets. And you can see here that they are sitting with a little bit over 5 million US dollars. As a matter of fact, I was even able to find the official um, filing for the financial transaction control systems. And you can see back in 2016, um, let me just get you down to where we see the uh, yeah, this is what I want to show you. So here we are again, again in the um, Summa Tilgangar, which is the total assets. They, uh, for 2016, had nearly $7.2 million. So this is 2016, and in 2015, they were sitting at a, a little over four. So they absolutely were going in the right direction as well. Okay, let's go back to your blog. So signing up on this particular um, e-wallet, which isn't even part of their business now, was is just 
It's just laughable. And yes, you found a report from a venture capitalist who is uh, was unlucky to invest in that thing. Well, when you're a VC, that is what you risk. And let me tell you that the venture capitalist might throw money to 100 companies. And if 10% are profitable, they are doing a good job. So the VCs are in the business to take that risk. And that's just that's just the real world. Okay, we go to this Ali Bank of Kuwait. And you said you simply couldn't find any information about this partnership other than Ripple's own press release. Well, I didn't even look because um, the next statement that you make just had me to where I just had to address that instead. I'm sure that if you took the time to um, translate some of the Kuwaiti uh, websites, you'd be able to find more information. But obviously, you didn't have the patience or the skill to do that. Well, let me just address this next thing you said. So you said that if anything looks like the Ripple's deal with Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi UFJ, it's no more than a dream painted with a stick on water. Are you kidding me? Are you really kidding me? Do you know that Mitsubishi is the largest bank in Japan? They are in 50 countries and they, they are the, uh, let's take a look at this. This is the actual, um, announcement that MUFG joins Ripple's global global payment steering group and they are the third largest bank in the world and if you just can't believe what ripple is saying here then i guess i need to take you so that you can actually hear from the horse's mouth which is the representative of mufg where he talks about ripple so let's just um let's just listen to this briefly more detail for us. Um, MUFG has a unique position in the Japanese banking society as being the only member, uh, uh, Japanese member, um, that's joined by the kind of global um, Ripple Net Advisory Board, which consists of seven, seven members. Um, okay, so he's just one of seven members on that advisory board. And uh, now I want to take you to uh, the next, here we go. We're going to go up to the 56 second mark. Okay, just have a listen. And I, I don't know what else to tell you except that this comes from the horse's mouth here. All right. Let me, uh, let me talk a little bit more about how we're using this and why it's important to us. You might be asking why does this really matter to us as a bank? Well, well, let me just take you back because he says about Ripple. So I, I, I didn't go up kind of here. Um, let's do slightly different uh, because uh, it, last year it was in Japanese, this year it's in English. But let me, uh, let me talk a little bit more about how we're using this and why it's important to us. You might be asking, why does this really matter to us as a bank? Well, we operate in more than 50 countries as a, corp as, a, as, a, as a bank around the world. So more than 50 countries have branches and operations, and we have to move money between all of those operations every day, and significant amounts of money. We've got a number of multinational corporates um, that operate across all of those, so they're huge liquidity flows occurring every day. Um, today, for many of us, we may have to go through kind of swift um, and incur charges, uh, many intermediary banks are uh, part of that. And typically an SLA for fund transfer movements is between one and three days. Using technology such as Ripple, we can get that down to something like 30 seconds, uh, which is significantly different uh, and at a cheaper cost as well. So it's not just the time saving, but the cost as well in terms of moving uh, money between our branches, between you know our different countries within our network. That's really important to us. We have solutions to do this today, of course, um, but we're always looking at how we can kind of bring them up to date, make them more efficient, more effective. Because by reducing the, the kind of operating costs for a bank, uh, we can you know uh, we can reduce our costs, compete more effectively in the market. Okay, so I just I just played you a tiny bit. This is just a two minute section of a 30 minute uh, discussion about how important Ripple is to the bank. And um, I'll put the link in the comment section if you wanna listen to the whole thing. But this is uh, from the largest bank in Japan, 
and it's just it's just unbelievable that you even wrote what you wrote. I want to thank Bank XRP for posting this back in um, what was it, Jan, uh, December twenty eighth, and uh, this is <clears throat> beyond proof that this is uh, that Ripple is very important to MUFG. Okay, so. I don't even, you know, this this is just crazy to even talk about the memorandum that you cite back from 2017. Well, we are in 2019 already. Okay, the next one is TransPayGo. They are an Austrian e-payments company whose main claim is to have a 78,000 page view per month. Okay, um, it seems neither here nor there, but a quick check with Similar web reveals that it's very, very generous. Well, I did that same check, and when I do that same check, oh, you know what? I I found a better check. Okay, all right, I found a better check, and I'll show you here. So, all right, let's go right to my check. So, I the check that you did doesn't actually give you a breakdown of. Um, I know that it doesn't give you a breakdown of the individual visitors. Uh, so, you know, citing the source that you used actually doesn't tell you whether or not they truly had 78,000 visitors per month. Here I used this particular one, and you can see in the um, ranking that for this company, which is, you can see TransPayGo, this is the domain analysis for them, you can see here that there are they have a global rank of uh, 4,737,570. Just so you know, and, and Alexa, which is probably the most uh, reliable ranking, you can see that they say uh, it has a uh, reach of uh, 4,458,000. But let's just just go basically it's four million in the world in the world there are 644 million active websites 644 million and you can see in the global rank they are four million that's pretty darn good it's pretty darn good so here we have their website and uh, you said that it was too difficult for you or you didn't want to go through the KYC process. Well, I tell you, if you're going to go to the extent of put this kind of information out, I think you should have some patience to go through the KYC process. I did in a matter of just a few minutes. And you can see here, I actually did it uh, on the 31st of January, which is my computer actually tracks US time. So I, I am Friday here in Japan, but I did this today. And you can uh, see that I just was given a password uh, and I can enter onto the site successfully. And uh, with kind re regards, I am good to go. So let's see here. Um, I found an article that is just a couple of days old, and it talks about the Viennese startup, TransGoPay, how they entered the partnership with Ripple. So this is actually a, a newspaper in um, Austria. Now, let me go back to your blog, and you say here that you didn't want to go through the corporate account KYC process. Well, again, uh, I don't see why not. It was easy. Uh, I did it in a matter of a few minutes. So you clicked on the non-company as instead, which uh, because you you wanted to register as an individual. Okay, when we look at this Vienna company, they are uh, a startup, and they specialize in international payment transfers for small and medium-sized enterprises. All right, so their business, their business really, their core business is to help these small and medium-sized enterprises. Individual people like yourself are really not their um, sweet spot. That's not what they're paying attention to. But the company has now partnered with Ripple and is one of the 
and is one of the first payment service providers for the cross-border money transfers to use the new blockchain-based Ripple technology X Rapid. So they are actually going to use XRP. Now look at this here. You can see that uh, in 2012 they were uh, founded and they specialize in international payment transactions for small and medium-sized enterprises. And you can see in addition private customers, which is then the step you took, private customers can use the TransPayGo platform called Fun Money to make the digital bank. And that is what you did. So you clicked on the link that said not a company because you're not a company, you're an individual, and it redirected you to this fun money, which is uh, not a subsidiary. It's, it's what they use for the non-company client. So um, you got on the same site I did, and yet you got some 404 error, but you don't tell us what you did because I can totally go as if I was a person in Cuba, for example, and I can go through the steps successfully to send money. And I will show you that. But so you just say, all right, let's try send money. Then this is what we're in for after all. And you don't really say what you did. I can't, basically, I can't recreate this 404 error. So you didn't really explain in detail uh, what you did. And then you just then go on to say in here that Ripple's client ecosystem is a sea of bullshit. Well, <clears throat> I, and that's the end of your blog. I just think it's just, uh, it's just beyond garbage. Um, so if we go to FonPay, I just want to finish and show you that uh, it doesn't take a long to, let's just say we are going to go to Cuba and I start a transfer and you'll see that then I have a chance to um, top up a prepaid mobile card or I can recharge my debit card I can send cash or I can charge a now to, I'm sorry I don't know exactly what that is it might be something special that they use in Cuba so if I hit uh, on send cash wow voila it works and I can choose to send my money either in euro or in uh, British pound sterling. And um, I can just tell you, and I don't want to waste everybody's time, it works. And I could not recreate that 404 error. So anyway, I am done. And that is all I really wanted to do. I don't want to drag this video out any further, but I really felt that somebody needed to show you that your argument that these partners are a scam is just not true. So that's enough. <laughs> and I've run out of time today to do what I really wanted to do was talk about Mr. Kitao of SBI Save Holding. So I'm going to work on that tomorrow. And uh, I need to say um, to everybody, take care. And sayonara for now. Bye-bye.